आज रात 12 बजे से संपूर्ण देश में संपूर्ण लॉकडाउन होने जा रहा है nearly 1 lakh cases a day west bengal we're getting in an update the schools and colleges will be shut due to the coronavirus our government has extended the closure of schools and colleges till august 31st something we have never experienced before and hopefully we never experience again amidst this dreaded pandemic you are about to resonate a confetti of emotions and begin a new chapter in your life but fret not for now you have valiantly reached the destination the road to which was infused with unimaginable hurdles the metamorphosis from tidy uniforms and polished shoes to casual outfits and study from home will be challengingly intriguing these walls and benches of st xavier's the likes of which are stained with glory has affected thousands of minds just like you till then sit back and let your screen surprise you as you log into a world of alchemy where you cherish and relish every moment passing by a world where you'll witness network issues seeding friendships In this wide infinity of doubt be assured as St Xavier's becomes your safe haven where you seek possibilities take actions and enable your progress Greetings from Inactus St Xavier's College to everybody who has joined us for this session today We welcome all faculty members and students to the first speaker session at Enthusia 2020 a vision that changed the face of kolkata by mr harsh vardhan niyotia we also have amongst us our teacher in charge mr arup kumar mitra the president of inactus india mr dev deep purkayastha the vice president of inactus india mr shmita ram kumar the inactus india leader ms neha saini for this session today we are glad to have you all with us inactus an organization where students take on leadership roles to bring about a revolutionary change in the society with an objective of creating a more sustainable world and reflecting upon our actions to transform lives we are instrumental in invigorating the potential potential prowess across the forsaken segments of our society and now introducing the man of the hour the chairman of the ambuja niyotia group a man whose lineage in real estate and the cement industry has transformed the architectural landscapes of kolkata one of the youngest recipients of the padma shri awards and someone who has walked those same corridors at st xavier's college at a time our speaker for today mr harsh vardhan niyotia we welcome you sir Hello. Good evening to everyone. Good evening, sir. Two of our very own enactors, Ayush Sharma and Marina Khatun, will be in conversation with Mr. Niyotia today. Over to Ayush and Marina now. well i think uh, it was a very long time ago i passed out in 1983 so uh, it's nearly 40 37 years back i think it was a different world that we grew up in compared to the world that we see now there was no technology as such virtually the computers also hadn't come in leave alone laptop and internet and mobiles etc so uh, it was a different world i think the pace was slow we had um, a lot of time to reflect and probably a lot of time to spend with friends uh, just like anyone else i think by i was in bcom honors so i had a morning uh, class at st xavier's and so pretty much the rest of the day i would work in my father's office for a while i i wanted to do ca so i uh, was also interning with a chartered accountant firm then i didn't uh, pursue ca further after doing my inter so uh, that sort of 
I abandoned and went and joined headlong uh, into business while I was still uh, studying. I think it was a wonderful period. I, the spirit of St. Xavier's is very special. It has a very egalitarian, cosmopolitan group of students. Uh, the fathers and teachers were very kind people, also very knowledgeable people. So all in all, it was a great, uh, fun experience, I would say. And I, I don't think I studied very hard while I was in college. And like many BCom students would relate, we used to bunk quite a lot and find ourselves at the Chaiwala in Russell Street more often than in the classroom. But that was towards the latter half of our education. The first year, I think our attendance was pretty good and then it started slipping. But uh, that's how it was. I don't know how it is different today. It must be similar, I think. So, so that your insights and your experiences surely you know, can we, a lot of us sitting here can relate and a lot of the first years who unfortunately have not been able to experience all that you've mentioned, bunking classes, going to Russell Street, waking up six in the morning, reaching the college on time, they, they have a lot to look forward to now. So, sir, as you mentioned that you passed out from the batch of 1983 and time was very different back then, um, you... Uh, the economic conditions prevailing in West Bengal at that time have seen a stark change as compared to now. So, according to you, what are the changes? How, how did you navigate through these changes? And what, according to you, could have been done differently to bring about these changes in a very bigger and a greater way? See, I think all of you read the newspapers. I'll be taking call to Newcastle if I talk about the hundred things that we should be doing and I think everyone knows what we should be doing. But we must also remember that we have a complex country, we have um, uh, you know, states and center and we have a nebulous relationship, not always friendly, sometimes hostile, sometimes friendly. We also have a very large number of our brothers and sisters who are below the poverty line, many of them who are disadvantaged. And, you know, for anyone, it is a very tough job to take this entire thing and make it grow. But having said that, there are some obvious things that we could obviously do better. We obviously need better infrastructure. We need more jobs. We need to push the economy closer to 10% growth than around 4 5% that we are experiencing over the last few years. And I think there are a few things that we all know that we need to do. But for one reason or the other, it doesn't seem to happen. But I'm sure everyone is making the effort. And uh, I, I do believe very strongly that India is going to be a very dominant economic power in this century. And for all of you who are very young and in your early 20s, I mean, you can look forward to a very, very glorious innings. Uh, I have no doubt about it. It's a question whether we will get there in the next three years, five years, or eight years. That's really uh, what the real debate is. Uh, thank you, sir. And I think Marina was facing some uh, connection issues due to which she has dropped. So not an issue I'll be taking over. So we see you as the chairman of one of the leading companies in India. So, however, most of us are unaware of the hindrances you have to face for, for one to reach where you are today. So, be it letting go of your love for real estate or going against the tide to again step into business you wish to do. Life has taken a full circle. So, for, so from your experience, so what advice do you have for us to overcome obstacles and how do we do away from that mentality? See, uh, what I have learned is that, um, you know, there is a certain amount only that you can plan. Uh, a lot of things happen in life, which is pretty unexpected. Uh, I'm sure many of you are in love. You probably have a relationship with someone. And you think when you are in that relationship, you think that's really uh, the most beautiful thing, which it is. 
and probably you also think that you know without that relationship your life would be meaningless and then something happens and then maybe it breaks apart and it breaks you also but after some time you get over it and something else happens which actually turns out to be more beautiful than the first one now there are life is full of these amazing accidents It's not all of them pleasant but i really don't think we are in control of every such event that happens similarly in your career you get some opportunities sometimes they are exactly what you wanted and sometimes they are not exactly what you wanted but somehow circumstances brought you for instance uh, i am in real estate and would you know that it was not something that i chose to be in uh, it was an accident my family was not involved in real estate they were involved in distribution of petroleum products through a chain of petrol pumps mostly in eastern india and we were also setting up the ambuja cement factory in gujarat when i was passing out of uh, college and my father wanted me to apprentice and be a part of either of these two businesses and for a while i was helping out in our uh, family business of petroleum products and then there was a time when i was to possibly go and help out in the cement business but somehow it didn't excite me to leave everything and go far away in gujarat and that to you know in a very remote location and it was a i visited once with my father and found it very difficult to navigate through all those big drawings complicated engineering drawings i was not an engineer and i kind of persuaded my dad that i should be allowed to think of something else and he was not very happy about it because that was our big investment at that particular point of time and he wanted me as the only son in the family to actually be in a part of it so while i was hanging around one family friend uh, was visiting us for tea one evening and he mentioned that he had a small plot of land of about 500 square yards in chorangi lane which is uh, somewhere near sada street kid street and uh, he wanted to sell the property couldn't find a buyer and he thought it would be a good idea if he could build some apartments and that may be easier to sell so i was sitting around and my father said you know you are doing nothing why don't you try and build these apartments for them and i said okay i didn't know anything about it our family didn't know anything about it but i jumped into it for only one reason because i had at that point of time nothing to do and i was feeling really guilty of doing nothing and just wasting my time so i jumped in and started the work and of course it was learning from the scratch i didn't have too much of guidance at home because nobody in the house had any idea they had probably built a house for themselves but they never built a project to be uh, done commercially so um, and then one thing after another somehow the project turned out to be fine we, we were able to meet with our targeted deadline to hand over the apartments we were able to sell the apartments we were able to make some more money than we had anticipated and it turned out better than we thought and then that gave me the confidence to look for the next project and the next project so actually what now turns out to be something that i deeply love and enjoy i got into it just by accident uh my second turn came when the family cement business had grown so big that after 15 years of doing real estate my father said that now enough of real estate the big thing that we are doing in the family is cement and you better go and get involved with that so again i didn't know anything about cement i was not very enthused about it because i was already doing well in the real estate business but i realized that it was the big investment of the family and i should help out because my father was getting on in years and somebody had to step in so i went in it took me a few years to learn that business with god's grace i got deeply involved and we were able to make a success out of the responsibility that i was given fortunately with the grace of god and the support of all my colleagues it kind of turned out to be a pretty good experience but then 10 years later 9 years later actually 
the family decided to sell the cement business because it was jointly held by my uh, maternal uncle's family and our family. And they decided that they should divest their interest in cement. So the company got sold. And here I'd spent the first 15 years of my life building houses, the next 10 years of my life building a cement business, and then back again to real estate. By that time, my real estate business had been virtually whittled down to a very, very small entity, which kind of survived, but there was hardly much business. So I had to pick up the threads right from zero once again, uh, 10 years afterwards. Now, all this roller coaster ride, I don't think one really planned for it. No, none of those decisions happened with my, with my knowledge or with my involvement. It's a, it was just something that I faced. And the important thing is not what is thrown at you. It's important is how you respond to what is thrown at you. So I said, OK, if this is what is, is ordained, then let's try and make the best of it. So the last 12, 13 years after we divested our cement business, so 14 years now, I have been concentrating on rebuilding the real estate business and the hospitality. We added hospitality and healthcare into it. And uh, of course, COVID notwithstanding, it was doing quite fine. Now, of course, we are jolted once again <laughs> because of this pandemic. And as you know, the pandemic hit real estate and hospitality in, in the most severe way. So here we are battling another battle. So such is life. So, sir, I believe from your experience, we have, you know, the part that you have to follow your ambitions, follow your dreams, but also it is not always about what you want to do. You have to see the circumstances. You have to see what, what opportunities and what circumstances you have to face. It really gives me a really clear vision on how I should see and how I should tackle my uh, problems that I face. So extracting from the experiences that you uh, provided right now, is there any particular personal anecdote or experience that most of us don't know about and you would like to share it with us? Well, I did share one with you, which probably many didn't know that uh, all these different businesses that I got associated were quite accidental and not really a choice in that sense. Uh, you know, the thing that I feel is uh, we must ask ourselves two very important questions. One question is that when and where you were born is not something that you decided. I'm sure your parents didn't take your permission before you came into planet Earth. Uh, the next most important thing in your life is when you will die. And I'm sure no, none of us know when and where it will happen and at you know, what age it will happen. Now, two of the most important events of your life, you have very little control over when and where you were born, when and where you will die. And when you were born, you know, there are so many children who are born in destitution, in poverty. Uh, you were lucky to be born to parents who could give you a decent upbringing, who could give you education, who could even give you two square meals and a, and a roof over your head. There are many, many children born who die out of starvation or due to lack of medicines, even within months of their birth because they were born so poor. Now, we never ask ourselves why we are lucky. Obviously, we are luckier than so many other people. We always look at someone who is luckier than us and then complain that why are we not that lucky? But you must know that everyone who is hearing this on this channel uh, today would be in the top 1% of India or maybe top 2% of India. 98% of the people in our country would be somewhat more disadvantaged than all of us. We never ask ourselves why we are in the top two percentile. Uh, but we often ask ourselves that why am I not you know, as lucky as my friend who probably has something more or something better. So I think the first thing is to have a sense of gratitude for what we have. And that's a very important part. The second is don't take life so seriously. You never knew when you came. You never know when you go. It could be tomorrow morning also. I hope everyone lives and I wish everyone a good life and good health. But certainly we don't know for sure that we are going to wake up tomorrow morning. 
And if that is so, why don't you live your life today as though it's your last day of the, in the world? Now, what if someone told you that today is your last day? What would you do? I think few things we will all agree that we won't do. We won't tell a lie, would you, if you were not going to live tomorrow? We would not steal money, would you, if you were not going to live tomorrow? We would be kind to everyone that you come across, wouldn't you? You wouldn't want someone to hate you tomorrow morning. I mean, if you just live your life as though this is the last day of your life, I think a lot of things changed, a lot of perspectives change, and we just become more compassionate, more kind, more human, and that makes us what we are, and that sort of improves the quality of our being and puts a smile on our face. It's not, you know, we should not get overwhelmed by the problems we face. It's important how you face the problems. The problems will get thrown at us and they will come from unexpected quarters. It's what is really important is how do you respond to them? Do you have the humility, the gratitude, the coolness of mind to be able to accept things that come to you and respond with grace and respond with compassion and respond, of course, with intelligence. This is what I would say. Thank you, sir. Sir, all the things you mentioned have become a very integral part of life today, especially with the numerous helpless people who, who are going through this pandemic. Sir, the scenario for innumerable has become that they are they become helpless. They didn't they don't have that source of income where they are able to sustain themselves, and now entertain a fixed cost cost of living amidst the pandemic. Sir, however, sir, sir, through articles and through newspapers, sir, we've seen that you are one of those people who's believe who's believed in helping the world. Sir, we believe that you are a firm believer in giving back to the society and this shows by the csr your company fulfills so for the past three financial years so your company has gone over and ahead over and above to uh, surpass their csr requirements and give back more to the society than it what was mandated so what are your views on csr and importance of csr in an organization See, first of all, let me tell you, I'm not one bit satisfied with what we are doing. Uh, you know, it's theoretical to say that, you know, we are doing more CSR than we are mandated to do. That's because there is a certain uh, government mandated kind of number. But, you know, CSR is a very emotive issue and you should do as much as you can do. And we certainly want to do much more than we land up doing. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that when I say CSR, I'm not looking at it technically. It's the way you respond. You know, you are running a social enterprise, enterprise what I understand. Now, what does a social enterprise mean? It means it is not maximizing profit alone, which is the mantra. It is about optimizing. Now, obviously, you can't run a commercial entity without having a viability to it. But viability does not mean exploitation. Viability does not mean not including, let's say, sustainability or environmental concern or empathy or, you know, generally being sensitive to the society in which you are living or staying. You know, all those things have to go together. And in that process, if the profits are somewhat reduced because you are, you know, doing sustainable practices or you're paying fair wages, then so be it. So be it, because at the end of the day, if we can help build a more healthy, a more robust and a more holistic development, then we are working towards a more sustainable future. Now, COVID is one such event which has exposed the underbelly of exploitation. We know very well that we have pushed the environment far too far and many things that are now creeping in and causing a lot of discomfort uh, is a pushback of some sort. Now, you know, we can we can argue that at the end of the day, this is a virus, but why is since 2003 to now, if you read some articles, they will tell you that about 10 to 12 different viruses have been inflicted upon the planet, which used to happen also in the past, but never happened at this amazing speed in such a short period of time, which means clearly 
there is a pushback coming because we are consuming far more than the planet can heal itself and afford to give. So I think we, now if you remember when the lockdown was there, one of the great joys that we kept reading in the newspapers was that we had the pollution free, we had blue skies that we could see, uh, people in Ludhiana could see the mountain range which was 500 kilometers away. I mean photographs were shown of that. I mean things which we should take as a necessity that we should have a clean environment became a luxury and became possible only because of a lockdown, uh, which is very, very unfortunate. So I think uh, when we look at all these aspects, it is important to see that our actions are holistic, sustainable, and more than anything else, deep within, as each human being, we respond with a certain level of compassion with a certain level of kindness uh, to whoever we come in, in, in contact with. So sir, your views have definitely shown us in the past answers and now that we, do, we know that life is very unpredictable and we don't know what might be in store for us next and your opinion is to live life in the best possible way so that you don't have any regrets. So when it comes to that, you have obviously followed your motto to the fullest and venturing into buying a football team to being an avid restauranteur, you've done it all. So bringing this diversity in your life and taking a mind of the business and the commercial commercial and corporate sector, you have, you have shown us that it is not always about work. So according to you, what importance does diversity hold in one's life and why is it necessary? See, it is not necessary. It is about the choices you make and it's about your own um, belief system. It's about your own way of thinking. I don't think there is one size that fits all kind of a shoe. Everyone is made differently. For me, I was born in a family that was deeply involved with the arts. Uh, there was music in my home. There was literature in my home. There was fine arts in my home. We lived in a joint family and different members of the joint family had different interests. Now we as kids in the family was exposed to all of this because we had lots of visitors. We had a kind of an open house culture. Lots of people used to come for dinner, for tea, for breakfast. And we uh, met all kinds of people. So I'm a product of that upbringing. You know, I can't claim any special credit for anything that today I'm, I'm able to know or profess other than the fact that I was just privileged to be born where I was born. And I lived in that milieu that shaped me the way I am. Now, that might not all be good. <laughs> there might be some things which were not probably as good as it should be, but uh, that's the way it was. And I think uh, because of that, my interests were varied. I had interest in arts. I had interest in architecture. I had interest in a lot of reading. I had interest in philosophy. You see uh, the portraits of four great men behind me. Uh, they have been my icons and their works have been greatly inspirational to me. So because of the situation in my uh, childhood, these influences came in. Now this does not necessarily hold true for everyone that I know. And that's nothing wrong. They could have different influences. Now, for instance, I am very, very far away from technology. I am embarrassed to say that it is, I was really uh, you know, challenged during this lockdown because I had to get, I mean, I was alone at home. I mean, alone in the sense, of course, I had my family, but I didn't have my office colleagues around. And I had to navigate technology uh, personally, which I was always depending on my secretary or my assistants to do. Now, I am not a technology person. I'm an artistic person. So for me, that was a struggle. Of course, thankfully, the lockdown managed to teach me a lot of things about technology that I didn't know, which is that I'm grateful for. One of those good things that have happened thanks to the lockdown. Of course, it has caused so much misery that I would never call it anything good. But uh, one of the good things, small things, is that I managed to at least navigate technology to save my life. So there are things which I didn't know and there are things that I couldn't do. But there are lots of things that I did. 
and uh, i think everyone has to figure their own life out i don't think that there is any formula and there should not be any such formula thank you sir so you mentioned sir that during lockdown sir you learned a great deal about how to navigate your way through technology sir gladly that it that is something i think the first years of st xavier's college this year are adept with sir but compared to the past 8 months so their routine has massively changed now so classes are online assignments are online exams and competitive exams have all stopped so what is one change in routine that you have seen a trend in so which is beneficial for all of us to follow when we are in lockdown and we are all isolated at home well on a very lighter note one of the things is that uh, you don't have to much bother about being dressed to work uh at a very short notice the moment there is a video call to be made you hurriedly put on a shirt or even short pants or pajamas and it's fine uh, so that is the one thing that i have uh, as a take away from this uh, highly technology induced world that we landed up into but i think it is also uh, frankly to me it's been not exactly a very pleasurable process i mean we made do with it because we didn't have a choice but human interaction is something which i find very special and endearing and to actually find yourself being scared of meeting other people is a very very depressing scenario and to be speaking to a screen and not to a person is not something that i greatly enjoy i do it because i have to do it but i would any day be happier to be in a hall with all of you guys there than to be speaking to you in this form i i can't see most of the people who are online uh and i have no clue what they are thinking or i have no idea what their facial expressions are so this is very very awkward but anyway such is life so so be it so you've caught ayush and me red handed so you saw the both of us giggling <laughs> you mentioned that how we dressed up our upper selves and all of us are just sitting in our shorts at home yeah i'm sorry people do that <laughs> we surely look forward to having another session in person with you and coming to the, our next question with respect to this is that in this current situation on the online everyone is doing everything online they are obviously coming across a lot of false news and a lot of myths so you being one of the industry leaders and being in the corporate sector for such a long time you also you know you have also come across a lot of myths that you think are completely untrue so to put us and the first years who are present here with us to on the right track we would like you to debunk a couple of myths that you have ever come across which you think are completely untrue so now how can you because every day you get your inbox flooded with all kinds of news and a lot of it fake news now you know the it's very difficult initially one used to get a uh, lot of so called sensational alarming news coming in uh, you are, initially i found them to be all true because i didn't know that they were there's a fake news kind of system so you would happily forward it and then you were yourself a party to spreading fake news now later on i realized that no 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 hang on if i get some news which is not on the news portals because you also get news feed from uh you know credible news agencies so sometimes when you get this and you say that it's not on any other news then you don't forward it because maybe this is not correct so that's one caution i have learned how to make that if you receive anything on whatsapp or whatever you first wait for the thing to appear on a main line news before you decide to take it seriously or not so sir with respect to that um there are also a lot of industry related myths that are there suppose people thinking that college studies obviously hold a great importance but the whole the only importance the major importance are college studies and not the practical knowledge or the co curriculars that one wants to pursue to be able to do be successful in the corporate world so so what are your views on this see nobody can say that studies are not useful but i think it is uh, not something that you should become obsessed with 
uh, if for any reason it does not interest you, we have enough examples in the world who have been college dropouts and have made extreme success. The point is, there are a few fundamental points. One is, do you have a passion? Uh, you don't want to study because you don't want to do hard work and you want to fool around. That's probably not a good excuse to drop out of college. But supposing you have a passion for art, for architecture, for photography, for design, for maybe singing, for playing a sport. Yeah, if you drop out for some good reason, I think it's fine. College is not the only place you educate yourself. There is today, particularly more than ever before, you have it on your little mobile that you carry in your pocket, the whole World Wide Web there. You have enough opportunity to learn a host of things if you're curious. But if you are not curious and you're lazy or you are just wanting to while away your time, sort of chit-chatting with friends or fooling around, and then you using the excuse that I don't want to do the formal study of college, I suppose that's diversionary and probably not a healthy way of looking at it. But if you are pursuing an alternate passion and you're deeply committed to it and you're also learning while you're doing that and you don't want to do formal education, I would not call it a very, very serious sin in any way. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, the pandemic has forced a lot of corporate giants to follow an employee cut down, uh, an employee cut down procedure. So a lot of people have complained about how companies are uh, firing people left and right. And so with this, a major issue, which again was on a path of recovery has come into uh, great news is women employment and women empowerment. So over the years, West Bengal and more or less all corporate giants in India have fought to make that ratio and even ratio. Sir, even at Enactus, which is a very basic level college society, so we try to make sure that we have a good balance between the team members. So, but again, during these times, a few myths have started flying around where corporates say that it's again a time where man can lead and they can do more here because of how the pandemic has, has changed the way of work. So what are your views on this? No, no. See, there are some physical aspects of men and women, which obviously are special. And there are some capabilities where women are better and some where men are better. Uh, but that is maybe very few. There would be a vast amount of activities where there is really no need to have a differentiation between whether a man can do it or a woman can do it. It's all about everyone's competence, their interest, and their commitment, and how many other responsibilities they carry. So there is a traditional view that the women carry other responsibilities, and therefore they are not able to give this concentrated effort. That may be a view of the olden times. It may not be applicable today, because I think men also equally support in terms of household uh, activities much more than they did in the past. So I think things have changed quite a lot. I think there is a much greater acceptance of the fact that uh, men and women can together uh, build their own careers and uh, and it can be done in some element of harmony. Uh, so I would generally support the idea, but I wouldn't get, I wouldn't obsess over it uh, because I think Everyone should have the freedom of choice to decide how they want to lead their life. So, sir, your visions on this scenario also make me curious about another scenario that you were a part of. So, as we know that as Kolkata, as we know today, uh, is very different than it was earlier. And you have a major role to play in this. So, when you started out in the real estate sector and when you started on your quest to rejuvenate the infrastructure and landscape of Kolkata, what vision did you have and what inspiration did you get? See, uh, the, there was no vision. You know, these are attributes given to you after some things happen. When you start off, there's, if you ask me honestly, I started off tr trying to make a small living. That's it. It was a vision was very small that let us do something 
my family comes from a business family i come from a business family everyone is involved in some activity i should also be involved in some activity and try to make a living for myself that's my simple thing i was certainly interested in doing it in calcutta because that's the place i was born and brought up in my family has been for 5 6 generations living here uh, more than 100 years and i felt that i owe it to the city of my birth and my upbringing to at least have some part of my business here i deeply love the city i love its cosmopolitan character i love the fact that it has a strong inclination to artistic talent and there are so many good things about the city this is not to say that there are not so many not so good things too but that's true for each one of us i mean i think each one of us come with a package of strengths and weaknesses so every city will come with some strength and some weakness but it was important for me to look at what is so beautiful about the city and to focus on that and my effort was initially to try and build a few projects that would rebuild the faith in the city rebuild the fact that calcutta can have some interesting projects and that was it i have my contribution is merely a drop in the ocean uh, nothing more nothing less the only thing that i we have tried to do is that see that most of our projects are meaningful they are contexted that means very calcutta and they try to be built in the best possible way that we could think of that's it simple not such a grand vision of any kind and i'm grateful to the citizens of the city and to many people who have blessed us and given us their support and we hope and pray that we continue to get this blessing and support in the years to come thank you sir uh, sir going back on the point of being able to learn and being able to follow your passion sir as you mentioned the four of the biggest companies in the world so their ceos are all college dropouts sir even though if they are stanford dropouts or harvard dropouts they still they still decided not to pursue education from the most premier institutes in the world and so very recently sir uh, elon musk quoted that you can literally learn anything off of youtube mm. anything which is there in the world which can be learned can be learned for free online and sir in today's world where pa- the pandemic has forced us all to stay back home and take online classes sir what are your views on the future of education in india sir so especially since a majority of the students attending today's seminar are all first year students so what is the what is the plan of action for the education sector in the country now that a new education plan has also been released see you guys are speaking from a platform of xaviers and you don't want me to say that uh, education institution doesn't have an important role to play well they 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 their role will transform certainly as people whom you have referred to have shown that maybe the traditional education which was confined to a teacher taught kind of a relationship will undergo a change because the teacher today is no more a person in a classroom it is as you said the world wide web it is the youtube it is uh, a host of other feeds that you keep getting on your mobile and your on your laptop so today you have many many more teachers and then than the traditional role of a guru shishya parampara that we were accustomed to so obviously the institution becomes more like a catalyst and an enabler rather than the only the uh, only place from where you can get the dissemination of information so this is the paradigm shift i think some element of formal education will always be relevant because very very few young people are self motivated to learn on their own they also don't know how to navigate through the huge plethora of information that is floating around so you need probably some guide to to take you through a particular route or a curriculum just like if you were left to cross a jungle uh, you would certainly probably find your way but it might have been very tough and it might leave you to take a very long time to find your way out but if somebody puts out a road and then guides you through a path it becomes somewhat simpler so similarly education institutions will become this catalyst 
that will help young people navigate their life to a particular direction based on your interest and also subject choices will no more be as rigid as it used to be there will be many options for you to change even change midstream you know one thing which was in our time that when you chose something you pretty much stuck to it till you passed out but that's not applicable today because children uh, change their minds so frequently and not for bad reason they suddenly find that they are not having that interest which they thought and they want to go to something else and i think this flexibility has to be now built into the education system which will allow them to skip from one to another and collect their grades as they move forward right sir so before we start taking questions from our participants today so we have one last question from our side so the average age of a participant attending today's session is 18 or 19 and so they've just stepped into a college and they've just started they've just uh, started this world where they they have to turn uh, theoretical knowledge into practical knowledge so what are few points which you would want us to keep in mind when we face the issues that we are yet to face in the world see it's not going to be any different now or ever in life i think the few very simple issues are that you need to have a sense of integrity uh i don't think i'm telling something which is rocket science uh, you if you are fundamentally somebody that can be trusted it will hold you in good stead number 2 you should be somebody with a curious mind irrespective of now or later learning never stops it's not like in college you will learn and then after you will stop learning you have to have a sense of curiosity a sense of uh, willingness to know all through your life when you were a child you had to have it when you are now a teenager you have to have it and right through your career you will have to have it third you have to be willing to work hard and work hard in the in a in a disciplined manner when i say disciplined it doesn't mean you can't go and shake a leg or have a drink i i don't mean that kind of uh, you know lifestyle issues but the discipline that you are going to put in say an hour of physical exercise to keep your body in shape the discipline to wake up at a particular time at least 5 days a week even if you decide to take 2 days to kind of have a little bit of a you know casual kind of a day the discipline that you're going to you know put your work time and your study time you want to set it aside you're not going to float in from one get together with friends to another binge party to another thing and then just sort of float around and this is more so for those who are privileged and who have financial support system i fear that they often lose their way i mean those who don't have this privilege the chances of them losing their way is very low because they have very very tough situation so they have to probably follow a routine so i feel that if you follow these basic principles of discipline hard work integrity uh, and uh, and things like that no matter where you are it should work fine thank you so much sir so we now we taking questions from the participants so uh, one of the questions which was posted by uh, So, by a student of Saint Xavier's itself, so he's asking, so what are the three books that have changed your life? Oh, father! Now listen, uh, <laughs> I have read so many books that it is very difficult for me to pin down three. But you know, it will be the usual suspects if I have to do three, because somebody who is deeply interested in Indian philosophy, one of the important books will be the Bhagavad Gita, and. it would be a must read for anybody uh, i have been very interested in reading devdat patnai kamish tripathi's books there are so many books of each one of them 20 30 40 books it's very difficult to give you a name but these are the authors ekat tolle i loved his work robin sharma uh, there are many of those people of course on the on the fun side i have loved uh, Agatha Christie at once upon a time um 
and of course there are other books which are on architecture and art that i have really been very fond of but that's because my interest is in that line on biographies a lot of business biographies biographies of all these people uh, who are my icons at the back here gandhi tagore vivekananda aurobindo uh, then i've loved reading about walt disney uh, his life i think it, it's one of an iconic company that i greatly admire and respect back home here of course you have um, very very important groups the tatas the ambanis the birlas all of their stories are extremely inspirational and of course there are the tech companies uh, infosys wipro etc tcs so i think we can go on and on i mean i'm um, somebody who's most prized personal hobby is reading and possessing books so this is a chapter that will take me through for the whole of the evening if you want me to talk about books so sir moving on to uh, the next question since we know that uh, neotia group also has in incubator programs which uh, in actus and zavier is also collaborated with we have a question from sakshi seth a student of st xavier's college uh, she asks do you think the conservative outlook of indians regarding expansion beyond our territorial borders is a big hindrance in the growth of many startups in general yes but uh, it it has to be very specific just because you are doing a startup that doesn't mean you have to go and expand all over the world i think india is a very big market for anything and to reach some kind of a critical stage you can very well do it in the country after that of course you have to move and then you should move but uh, at the very beginning if you think that as a startup you need to be exploring the world opportunity maybe it's not necessary because we have a very large market here and it may be just too cost ineffective to do it uh sir so janvi has another question so she says so what according to you are the attributes of a good leader who are able to lead and inspire the masses i think i've answered that earlier uh, those personal qualities that i spoke about so dev goel is asking so how to have a definite vision like you in life what's it i didn't understand So Dev from San Diego, so he's asking, so how to have a definite vision in life? So just like you, a definite vision in life. No, no, I told you my, <laughs> I didn't have a vision. I I was uh, a product of my circumstances, and as I said, even my career choices were accidental. Uh, they were not something that I sort of planned and chose. It's another matter that when they came to me, I tried my best to make it some. to make it something that i would like to work on and work with uh, sincerity to make it work so it's i don't think we really frankly you know very very few people i think have the choice of really designing a vision and then working towards it we often land up somewhere and then we land we have to try and make that work Uh, so one more question sir which i personally also had so it's very difficult to get behind a task if it's not the it's not the most interesting task but you somehow know that it is a task which if not done will will cause you difficulties later in life so but at the at given point of time it is not the most interesting thing to do so how do you so how do you suggest that uh, youngsters like us get that focus and get that discipline to not procrastinate a task and to complete it as and when they come see the moment you know that it's an important task that you ought to do it's like you know if you're overweight and you have to get up in the morning for a run i think most people will agree that it's not the most happy thing to do but if you realize that if you are not in good health it will cause other consequences Uh, for 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 a starter, you will not get into the best of your clothes, and for uh, the rest, you will you will feel sloppy during the day. You will make that effort because the consequences are not good. 
i think the moment we know that a particular task is important because it leads to good consequences then you would find the energy and motivation to do it right sir uh, sir so, rupesh is asking sir how so sir so also this is a question for uh, someone from a college student sir he thinks you have you will have great inputs for it sir is asking how do you manage college studies with professional careers professional exams and the extra curricular that takes place in college how how can one strike a balance between the three again it's a question that is very individual and it depends on what your interests are fortunately i had a lot of interests and i was able to bring some of them in my work and some of them i was able to pursue along with my work so uh i'm not quite sure whether everyone has the same set of situations it, there is no formula for it if you have the will you will find the way so sir with that we have another question from dikshita jain she is asking like we have strategies in business do you have strategies in uh, strategies in life like investing your time on those people from whom you can expect returns both emotionally or in monetary terms i don't think we should put any transaction to human relationships i don't think we should have expectations you 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 be involved with people because you enjoy that process and i don't think it should be with an expectation of getting something in return yes only thing that you can hope and and that too i don't think you should expect but you can still hope is that you get back love and you get back respect uh, like you give but anything which becomes monetary or transactional or gain in a more material sense i think takes away from the quality of the relationship so with that we'll come to the last question for today uh so st xavier's is the oldest campus in west bengal and one of the oldest in the country and so people coming out of st xavier's have a huge connect with the with the city as many put it the unity within the community of st within the community of west bengal and its people is immense so some say this is the factor which is slowing us down but some say this is the hidden talent which the which the uh, city has which will eventually boost it forward so what according to you is in store for the future of calcutta well as someone deeply invested in the city uh, both financially and emotionally for me it is only a way forward in a positive way uh, you are probably asking a biased person and my answer will be always in a in a very pro calcutta way well as i explained i have a bias i am born and brought up here i have my best friends here i have my family here our family has been here for a very long time and i have a large part of my business here so i am deeply emotionally and uh, my career invested in the city so naturally i have a very strong optimistic feel about it but even objectively speaking i do feel that we have moved quite a lot from where we were and we are in the right direction we often get frustrated that we could always do it faster but that is true for the rest of india as well that we could have actually grown faster we could have done something faster so i think both the country and the state is moving in the right direction uh, certainly if we put in more effort we can push the speed a little that's my only desire that we can push push it harder so that we can lift more people out of poverty faster thank you so much uh, sir ayush and myself so we, we are very grateful to have a conversation with you so throughout the conversation there were moments where i was actually introspecting and i was actually thinking about the incidents which i had i have faced and how i could have done things differently like you explained and so it's an honor for us and an honor for an actor sen zevias to host you today so i'll pass i'll pass on the conversation to siddhi who will take over from ayush thank you ayush aditya and merina after an enthralling hour of conversation i would like to take this opportunity to thank mr harshvardhan newtia 
on behalf of Inactus St. Xavier's College for his words of inspiration, which have truly left us enthused. I'm sure it has been a highly memorable session for all those who have attended it. At this point, Mr. Nyotia will be leaving us as he has other engagements. I thank him again for his presence. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. With this, we have come to the end of our first speaker session for Enthusia 2020. We thank our teacher in charge, Mr. Arup Kumar Mitra, for his constant guidance in organizing the session. We would also like to thank Mr. Dev Deep Purkayastha, President in Actus India, Mrs. Shmita Ram Kumar, Vice President in Actus India, and Ms. Neha Saini, in Actus India leader, for their presence today. This session would not have been possible without the overwhelming response of all the attendees. We had 700 participants from St. Xavier's College, 300 college students from all across India, and 100 graduate participants, making it a total of 1,100 attendees for the session today. So we thank you all for your active participation. We thank ME for enabling such a smooth speaker session. The details for our next speaker session will be shared shortly on all our social media handles. So stay tuned as we look forward to seeing all of you again there. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Siti. A very good evening to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, I am Aditya Vikram Bajaj, a third year student from Enactus in Zegas. We just had a few clarifications for those uh, people taking part in Enthusia. Uh, a few of you had issues regarding the number of rounds, uh, the elimination process and the finals. Uh, here's a quick rundown for you to uh, ensure that you don't have any further issues moving on. Uh, round one for all the five events are live. Marketing and designing have their deadlines tomorrow, whereas the other three events have their deadlines today. You have to send in your tasks in a set format to the set mail, which is mentioned in the mail and the PDF. After which we will judge your submissions and a mail for round two participants will go out. All rounds are elimination based and not all events have the same number of preliminary rounds. Few have two, few have three. Some others may have a different number of rounds. However, all rounds come to an end on the eighth post which the names of the finalists will be announced. The finals take place next week on a Saturday and a Sunday. So missing classes are not is not an issue. They're all online. However, they'll be live as well. So you'll have to attend a meeting or a conference at the set time. And as uh, Siddhi mentioned about a second speaker session, stay tuned to our social media pages. You can connect with us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. And we also have our own website. That is www.enactorssxc.org. Uh, we'll keep on updating you regarding all the progress. A few perks for the winners of Enthusia are finalists of Enthusia get 10 hours of non academic credits, and speaker sessions get two hours each. Whereas the winners of Enthusia, they get a direct personal interview, they get to the direct personal interview round of an actor and Xavier's recruitments. So recruitments shall take place after Enthusia is over. And we hope to see all of you take active part in Enthusia and especially active part in recruitments. Once again, thank you for joining us. You may now leave the meeting. Uh, we have recorded attendance and credits with time will be awarded to you. Thank you so much.